Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and pleased to tell you that the Kindle edition of the second edition of the CODIS is now available for $2.99. If you ever wondered what could be the most diabolical plan to keep Jesus from coming back, this is that story of the weaponization of the DNA of the Y chromosome that determines who is part of the line of Aaron. Can you imagine if there was a weapon that wiped out all the line of Aaron so that the high priest did not return and lead the Sanhedrin that calls for the return of Jesus? Then Satan wins and rules this earth forever. It may be a work of fiction, but it's actually going on right now all over the world, and especially in Tehran, where they're looking to take this 23andMe, this database that you have. There is a Y chromosome marker that says that you might be in the line of Aaron. He's out to get you and take you out so he can rule the earth together. An amazing story read by tens of thousands who have given it nothing but five-star reviews. We dropped the price to $2.99 to get this into every home that we possibly can. And from the same author, uh, I'm sorry, the same publisher that our guest author is today from Destiny Image Publishing, my new book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. Visit ignitinganation.com, our website, scroll to the bottom under special offers and click on the cover of the book. Give us your email address and we'll give you the first chapter for free. We will not send you spam because spam is not kosher. It's my privilege to introduce you to our guest this morning from our publisher, Destiny Image Publishing, Robert Henderson, author of the new book, Receiving Healing from the Courts of Heaven, Removing Hindrances that Delay or Deny Healing. Robert Henderson, welcome to Revealing the Truth. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Robert is a global apostolic leader who operates in revelation and impartation. His teaching empowers the body of Christ to see the hidden truths of Scripture clearly and apply them for breakthrough results. Driven by a mandate to disciple nations through writing and speaking, he travels extensively around the globe teaching on the apostolic, the kingdom of God, the seven mountains, and most notably, the courts of heaven. He's been married to Mary for 40 years. They have six grandchildren, six children, five grandchildren, and they enjoy life in beautiful Midlothian, Texas. Uh, receiving healing from the courts of heaven. Uh, Robert, you have written um, so many books and talked so much about the kingdom of heaven and how we as a body are not operating in the fullness. Uh, you know, it's both a diagnosis of a malady or a cancer or a heart condition, but it's also the prescription for moving from dis-ease into power and authority. In your experience, what do you assess as people's understanding of this concept of the court of heaven? Yeah, well, of course, my, my understanding of it began about eight years ago. Uh, and what when I began to get a hold of the courts of heaven, it completely changed the way I view the spirit realm. Uh, uh, I, 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 like any, anybody else that has been in the ministry or whatever, I had, a, I had a view of the spirit realm and the way it operated. Uh, the protocols, maybe you would say, that were associated with it. But when I began to understand that there was a very real court in heaven and that Jesus actually spoke parables to us to teach us how to enter those places, uh, it changed everything. It changed the way that I saw. And what it, but what it also did was it began to bring immediate, I mean quick, breakthrough into our life. Uh, for instance, there were prayers we had been praying for years that had seen no results. And within days, literally within days, uh, those, those prayers were answered when I began to approach it from a court of heaven perspective. And so everything began to shift and everything began to change. Um, we, we read in the Psalms the uh, big E Elohim, okay, the God that we know of, the God of heaven and earth. And then we see the little E Elohims. And we hear about this whole council of heaven, all right? 
gathering together in the court of heaven. This is, and an, you know, I love to think of it as the Supreme Court with the, with the Chief Justice. And then to his right is Jesus. Uh, and then there is this council of heaven that are sitting in those other chairs, uh, just like we would see the seating of the Supreme Court. And we see the prosecutor's table, and we know who the prosecutor is, uh, Nahash, the serpent, Hasatan, Satan. And then we see, oddly enough, sitting not just at the right hand of the Father, but sitting in the defender at the defense table, the very person of Jesus at the defense table and at the right hand of the Father. And our minds cannot wrap ourselves around this concept of, well, how can he be sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for me? And he's my defense. Mm -hmm. Well, help us understand this this mystical, magical, amazing picture that is portrayed here of what the courts of heaven look like. Yeah, you know that. I mean, that's a really good question, and what you're describing is is uh, is awesome. You know, uh, first of all, let me just say that that when Jesus taught on prayer in the book of Luke, and, and for real quickly, he put prayer into three dimensions. He taught to approach God as Father in Luke 11, as friend in Luke 11, but then in Luke 18, he began to speak a parable about approaching a judge, which was basically saying that God is a judge, not an unjust judge, but a judge, that if this widow in that parable could get a verdict from an unrighteous judge, how much more can we come before the judicial system of heaven and get verdicts from God? So those were the three dimensions that Jesus actually taught. And so the third dimension is approaching God as judge. And of course, like you just said, we have Jesus uh, not only at the right hand of the Father, but also standing as our advocate, First John 2 says. He's an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And I believe that Hebrews 12, 20 through 24, actually describes for us the spiritual dimension of the courts and the counsel of the Lord. Because it says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem. And then it begins to go through coming to the General Assembly, the Church of the, of the Living God. Uh, and then it talks about uh, innumerable company of angels. Then God, the judge of all, to, uh, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to the, to the mediator of a new covenant, that's Jesus Christ the righteous, to, to the blood that's speaking or giving testimony. So everything that's being described there is legal in nature. And so what I teach is that when we approach God as judge, we are actually stepping into a spiritual dimension of all of this heavenly activity that God grants us the legal right to be a part of, and that he actually cannot get done in the earth what needs to be done until we take our rightful place in the midst of all that you've described and what I believe Hebrews 12, 22-24 is describing. Isn't it interesting, as you're, as you're painting this picture, I'm seeing the cross, and I see it now um, in the Hebrew, we call it an eight, a tree. He was hung on a tree. But mm -hmm. now I see it as a bar. And that as believers, we all get to pass the bar. And because we get to pass the bar, we ha are now allowed not only to be, we, we go from being in the gallery because we pass the bar, we now have our juris doctor we are now given authority. And it's interesting that you start in Luke where you do because two prior chapter to that uh, in Luke 10, 18 and Luke 10, 19, Jesus describes for the disciples a specific event that takes place. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven and I give you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing whatsoever shall harm you. And then the, he follows that on with the three uh, levels that you just described. So now I have authority. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the dominion that was robbed of me in the garden, usurped by Satan, where we were given dominion over the earth, but we lost it. It was usurped by Satan. It was given to Satan. is now given back to us. Yes. 
And now we have authority. Now, if we are, have authority and we can say to that mountain, be moved, if we have authority and we see this amazing picture that anything that has a name, God has given us dominion over. He started that in the garden and we lost it, but now he's given it back to us. This is why you go to the doctor, get a diagnosis. He can't treat you if he doesn't have a diagnosis. So we now have a name. When you and I pray for a person, we call by name. We don't just say, Lord, we want them to be healed. We speak to that cancer. We speak to that carcinoma. We speak to that cell. That we speak right to it because we know its name. Uh, we see this as a pattern. What is it that people are missing in this realm of, first of all, receiving healing from the courts of heaven, uh, breaking it down to why don't we understand the court of heaven? Why don't we understand healing? And why aren't we receiving it? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a couple of things I would mention about that. For instance, in Zechariah chapter 3, when Zechariah uh, says, when he sees Joshua the high priest, which the high priest is the highest position, functioning position in the courts of heaven. People don't realize that's a legal position that Aaron and all that were after him function in. Of course, now Jesus is occupying that place, right. the high priest. But in, in, in the days of Zechariah, Joshua, the high priest, had on unclean clothes. And so he had lost his right to present cases before the courts. And so what's happening is that he's on trial. The enemy has brought an accusation against him. But before it's done, he has on clean garments, clean turbans, because of angelic and prophetic input into his life. Both the angels and the prophet said, put new clothes on him. Well, once that happens, God says to him, here's what the prophet says. He said, if you'll walk before me, I'll give you places to walk among these that are here, or this spiritual dimension. I believe the court of heaven. And then he says this, and he said, I will give you charge of my, uh, uh, of my courts and give you authority over my house. And so, so he literally went from one who was on trial as a defendant to one that now has the right to judge in the courts. Because, see, I believe that not only do we need to know how to function in the courts, but once we've done what we need to do, God actually releases us into a place of judgeship into the courts, that from, that from the courts, as a representative of who he is, we can release judgments into the earth. You see Paul doing this when he dealt with the sorcerer that was resisting the leader. Uh, you see Peter doing the same thing with Ananias and Sapphira. You see judgments coming against anything that was resisting God's kingdom purpose from happening. And I believe there's a new dimension of authority from the courts of heaven that God wants to move us into so that we're not just getting cases um, uh, brought and, 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 and decisions made in our behalf, but we actually become those that can stand as judges from the courts of heaven and render judgments that began to set divine order in God's kingdom. So that's just part of a, a little bit of it. I believe that's essential even in the healing realm. You know, back in the Garden of Eden, we read in the Hebrew, it says the voice of God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The voice travels on sound. Uh, and what I proclaim, uh, Jesus says that I am the way, I am the truth, that I am the life, that no one comes to the Father but through me. So I have access to the throne by my spoken word, therefore, I don't have to be transported to the third heaven. My voice, right, just like God's voice walking in the garden, my voice will transcend, uh, pass the atmospheric heaven, pass through outer space into the court room, uh, the court of heaven, and my petition, the bailiff, uh, says, yes, we'll hear case number such and such, all right? And my advocate is pleading my case because he now knows my case uh, because he has a relationship with me. I've confided in him. It's client confidential what I've confessed to him. So now he is going to the father and building the case 
for my forgiveness. And the argument is, is that he comes unto me because he has believed in his heart and professed with his mouth. Therefore, your, your honor, your lordship, your judgeship, uh, we ask you to dismiss this case. We have a motion to dismiss this case. We're not asking you to rule on this case. We're asking you to dismiss this case because what he says he may have done, I'm telling you, put it on my account. All right. Yes. We motion for dismissal. All right. And, and because we are all familiar with the legal shows and the legal system, I frame it that way because this is exactly what happens. Jesus stands before the Father and says, oh, case number such and such, I got this one covered. You put that one on my tab. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why do we not get this? Why do we think that there is such this <clears throat> mysterious enshrouded in mystery, but it's so clearly stated in the scripture, and then we don't walk in healing because we don't feel that our, um, that my passing the bar, my jurist doctor is not strong enough for my defender, my advocate, is not strong enough. My uh, and he's and he's my um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, your court-appointed attorney. He's your pu public defender. Yeah. All right. Well, he's actually not a public defender. He's a private defender. Mm -hmm. He only defends those that he represents. Yes. Why do we not see that? Why don't we get that? I, I one of the reasons that we don't get it. Number one is because we have we have a culture today in the church that is biblically illiterate. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we no longer, the Bible is no longer emphasized. Doctrine, theology is not taught. Uh, it's all about how somebody feels or, or whatever, and not realizing that feelings are determined by belief systems. And, and if, you can, if you can believe the right things and experience the right things, then, then the right feelings will come. But what I wanted to say out of what you just said is that I teach that, for instance, out of Hebrews 12, 24, that the, there is a blood, which is the blood of Jesus, speaking better things than that of Abel. Well, if you go back to Genesis 4, Abel's blood crying out from the ground caused God to render a verdict against Cain. And so we now know we have a blood, which is the blood of Jesus, that's not crying for judgment. His blood is releasing a testimony that's, that's requiring or asking for, dis, for forgiveness and dismissal. So what I tell people, I said, God is always, you can search through the scripture from beginning to end. God's heart has always been forgiveness. He just didn't have the legal right to do it. And so with the blood of Jesus, the testimony of the blood gives God the legal right he needed to be able to forgive us. See, the blood of bulls and goats would that would testify as the high priest would administer it uh, in the days of the tabernacle gave God the legal right to roll sin off for a year. But every year they had to do that so there was a reminder of how evil they had been. But now the blood of Jesus not only gives God the right to cleanse us, it, it causes him to be able to wash us so that we no longer have a consciousness of sin, but now we have, we're restored back to a consciousness of God, which is what Adam and Eve had before they fell. And so, but, but it's, it's the blood, the testimony of the blood that's giving God that legal right. So I many times will come before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm agreeing with what your blood is saying. I'm not agreeing with what I feel. I'm not agreeing with the whispers of the enemy that's bringing condemnation and guilt and shame. I'm agreeing with the testimony of the blood of Jesus, that his blood is asking and requiring that, that Lord, that you would forgive me. And that not only is his blood speaking, but he's also speaking as the mediator of the new covenant in my behalf as well. Because I believe there are many voices speaking in behalf of the purposes of God, but also our purposes as his people in the earth. You know, I absolutely love the fact that you get that John 19.30 is, yeah. is really, the, those are the last three words of the Old Testament. That's the framework for paid in full. Everything that happens after that is the New Testament. 
Now, just because we have, have, as men, have chopped it up, everything prior to the speaking of the words, it is finished or paid in full, the fulfillment of the law, is under the Old Testament. And if we think of it in that framework, that the New Testament doesn't begin until the earthquake, it doesn't begin until the raising of the Jewish saints, it doesn't begin until the garment rent and the veil rent and two. That's the New Testament beginning. It truly begins after Jesus speaks the words, it is finished, which is at the same time that the priest is cutting the throat of the Passover lamb, also saying it is finished, paid in full, the price for our redemption is now fulfilled. And you get this because you say in your book, this was a legal statement. There was yes. nothing left that Satan could use to prevent the healing of God from coming to those who belong to him. Legal things were now in place for a full manifestation of healing and wholeness. This is the gavel dropping verdict rendered, okay, mm -hmm. that all who come under the covering of this finished and fulfilled law are now not, they are guilty, but yet they are innocent. They are guilty, but yet they are set free. They are found guilty, rendered guilty, but under no condemnation whatsoever because of the blood of Jesus. Yes, there's going to be discipline. Okay? There's going to be consequence. There's going to be a season of dryness. There's going to be, look, you can't walk in sin as a believer and continue in your sin uh, and really be a redeemed believer. Somebody needs to grab you, shake you, wake you up, pull you out of that adulterous relationship, pull you out of that same-sex relationship, pull you out of your addiction to say to you, hold on a second. You, you've been set free. You've been forgiven. Now, unless you let go and you open your hands and your hands are extended and say, Sir, who can go up to the mountain of the Lord? The one with clean hands. Unless you take that syringe out of your hand, unless you take that keyboard out of your hands and God inspects your hands and sees they're clean, you can't go up the mountain of the Lord. I don't care whether you're Old Testament or New Testament. Right? God cannot look upon your sin I, and see you face to face. New covenant believer, old covenant believer, doesn't matter. If you are in sin, God cannot look at you face to face. It means you're walking away. You can only see the back of your head. So now we get to this understanding where we're about to go to break, where we're going to dive into receiving healing and why healing isn't manifesting the way you and I both have experienced, mm -hmm. uh, short of I've never raised somebody from the dead, but I tried for three days because I really believed that the breath was going to come back into this child. And so three days I sat by his coffin and said, come forth. I'll tell you the rest of that story and how God answered it when we come back from this break. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Igniting a Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the books and media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. 
In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5th, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and talking to our guest, Robert Henderson, author of Receiving Healing from the Courts of Heaven, a new release of depth and understanding of how we really can receive healing. Robert, welcome back to the program. Thank you. It's so good to be with you. Years ago, I had a healing service where a young child, two and a half years old, who had never walked, came from the back of the sanctuary to the front on a little walker, a back walker, you know, kind of sitting and scooting, and came forward, and I asked him his name, and he told me his name was Brian, and I said, what, and what do you want me to pray for? He said, I, 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 I want to run. I said, you don't want to walk? He said, no, I want to run. And so he had never taken two steps on his own in his life. And so I laid hands on him and I got down at his level and I wrapped my tallit around him and I anointed him with oil. And his mother stood by watching tears pouring down her face. And I prayed for him and I said, um, if you can't get up now, do not be concerned. God's at work 
and your healing will come. And his mother just looked at me like, almost, how dare you say such a thing? Two weeks later, I didn't hear from the family at all. No words. There was no miracle that happened. Nothing took place. He scootered out, a happy little boy, but couldn't walk. Two weeks later, I get an email with a video clip. And the video clip is of him running. Wow. And the family sees him run. So Brian is diagnosed with a chromosomal disorder, requires many bone marrow transplants, and finally Brian doesn't win the battle. And at five years old, he passes from this earth into the healing hands of the father. And the family calls me and says, we want you because you were so close to him to preach his service. We're going to be doing a um, Thursday night visitation, a Friday night visitation, a Saturday service with a private internment on Sunday afternoon. In, in Judaism, you know, like we're in and out. In Christianity, we can spread. So there was a large gathering, and I sat in the front row right across from the coffin, and I could see Brian's face. And I would just sit there whispering while people were passing by, Brian, come forth. Brian, come forth. And I kept believing in his healing. And so finally, the healing doesn't come. Uh, we have the funeral service. And the family wants to do a private graveside. And we get out to the graveside. Uh, but before that, the family asked me into the viewing room. Uh, everybody's out. It's he and the mother only. And she said, will you pray out loud and circum walk, walk around his coffin seven times, and I am going to put my mouth over his mouth and nose and breathe, and will you cry out to God? And so I began to cry out in the Spirit and then out loud, saying the Lord, Lord, if you just gave us one more year with this child, we will sing your praises forever. Lord, it was almost like Abraham's negotiation for Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, if you would just give us 12 more hours. If you would just give us, Lord, if you would just give us one more day. And I kept saying, Lord, all we're asking for is one more day. And we will honor you and glorify you. I finished the seventh time. She finished blowing into his mouth. And Brian was not, he was still in the coffin. We proceeded to the graveside. It was myself, the mother, the father, and the three siblings. And for some reason, the Lord put it on their heart that we were just not ready to lower him in. Is it okay if we go to lunch and just as a family go to lunch together and you go off and we'll call you and meet you back here when it's time to lower him in to the grave. And I said, absolutely. Then they said, you know what? Join us for lunch. And I said, okay. While we were at lunch, the funeral home calls and says, in 35 years, this has never happened. And we said, what, what's happened? They said, well, there was a large rainstorm the other night, and somehow Brian's grave collapsed, and we will not be able to bury him for one more day. Hmm. God answered the prayer. Now, he didn't allow us in life one more day. But God gave us exactly what I prayed for. Lord, if you would just give us one more day with him. And so on that Monday, we finally buried him. But we got one more day with Brian. Mm -hmm. This is the court of heaven answering, not as our natural expectation. I wanted him to sit up and jump out and dance around seven times and say, you know, I saw you do that, and I wanted to do that too. But God answered that prayer with one more day. That to me is a miracle. That to me is the miraculous. Yes. And why 
are we not seeing more of this, Robert? Why are we not experiencing and why are our churches not embracing the anointing of oil and the laying on of hands and the calling forth for healing? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that, that, I mean, from a court of heaven perspective, um, about, it was, it was, it was actually it was no, uh, November of 1999, I had, I had a dream. And in the dream, basically, I won't go into the whole dream, but the Lord uh, commissioned me, called me to go after the healing anointing. And he told me, he said, you have to go get it. And it wasn't like I had to go someplace and get it. It was in the spirit realm. You've got to go and apprehend this uh, that I've actually died for. You know, I've, I've come to believe something. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, we by faith have access into the grace in which we stand. So we're already standing in a spiritual dimension, but we have to access that by faith. And so because when Jesus died, he, he, he positioned us, if you will. When we accept him, he positioned us. And of course, that's what I believe it means in Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, when it says we have come to all of this spiritual activity. In other words, we, we're, we're already there. Uh, we simply need to know how to access what we've already come to. And I tell the church when I teach, I say, you know, one of our problems is we keep trying to get places we've actually already come to. That if we understood hmm. by faith what Jesus did on the cross then and, and at, his re- at his resurrection, then we have been positioned when we accept him, that we are seated together with him in heavenly places. And, and, and he said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, I was reading it just a few moments ago, where he said, if you be seated with Christ, seek those things which are above, uh, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your affection on those things. And so in other words, we by faith have to focus our attention and move into the place we've already been granted and the place we've already been given. And that's one of the things the church doesn't understand. They don't understand where we are. So we began to move. We began to function in the healing anointing. We, we, we saw, as you were describing, we saw a lot of healing healings take place, a lot of things. We saw people coming out of wheelchairs. We saw MS conditions. We saw blind eyes open. We saw lots and lots and lots of deaf ears open. Uh, that seemed to be a, a real uh, a, a specific anointing for that. I just saw lots of things, uh, um, but and, and, and still do to this day. But in the as we were getting started in that and, and we were pretty well moving in it, uh, it was it was a it was a very common uh, uh, expression of what we did as a church. But also we had healing services once a month, and we would have hundreds not not necessarily thousands, but hundreds come from around the regions that would come to these. Long story short, was my wife suddenly one day had a dream, and she came to me. And she said this, she said, in my dream, I heard God's voice. God's voice spoke to me and said these words, tell Robert that if he does not pray for them correctly, they will die. And I looked at her and said, what am I supposed to do with that? I mean, I was doing everything I knew to do, everything I'd been instructed in, everything I had discovered myself. And now hear God saying, tell him, tell me that if he doesn't pray for them correctly, they will die. Well, I didn't know what that meant, literally, until I discovered the court of heaven, which was many, many years later. And I became convinced that when Jesus died on the cross, according to Isaiah 53, verse 4, that he bore away our sicknesses and he carried away our pains, which we know that's what it actually says in the Hebrew. It says griefs and sorrows, but but his pains, diseases, all that, that when Jesus died and then by his stripes were healed, that when he died on the cross, he cared that that was the legal verdict that was rendered. But, but, and so that, that part was done, but that if there was still something legal in the spirit realm that the enemy would use against us, he could deny us what actually Jesus died for. And so just real quickly to explain that, First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Peter said, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. That is the Greek word antidikos, and it right. means one who brings a lawsuit. It's a legal position. In other words, it's describing Satan as a legal opponent in the spirit world. It said that he, as the adversary, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Of course, sickness is a devourer. So he's so P- Peter is saying, you be on guard because he is your legal opponent that is looking to build a case against you to be able to devour your life, your future, your destiny, your children, your finances, whatever it may be, your health. Okay, so 
So the word anti vehicles it actually comes from two words, anti, which means to instead of or to stand against, and vehicles, which is rights. So the purpose of Satan as our legal opponent is to deny us what's rightfully ours. That somehow or another, as our legal opponent, he can build a case against us to deny us the right to be healed that Jesus actually died for us having. And so I have come to believe that 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 it, we have to discern sometimes what the enemy is using. I teach this, that Satan actually works from two positions. He works from both a legal and an illegal position. He works from a legal position as the anti decos like I just described. But he also works from the illegal position because he's a thief and a robber. And so... So the way I approach, if somebody's sick and diseased and I'm praying for them in a healing service, I'm assuming that he's doing this as a thief and a robber. But if I if I attack that thing with my faith and with the anointing and with what Jesus did for us on the cross and it doesn't move, then I have to consider that maybe he's using something legal here, that there's a legal case he yet has that is allowing him to deny us the right of everything Jesus died for us to have, which includes healing. And so I have to begin to discern that. And I really saw this in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, the woman that is bent over for 18 years, uh, and Jesus sees her, and it says in verses 10, I think 10 through 19, it says that Jesus looks at her and says, woman, you are loosed. Well, that's really interesting, because the word loosed is apoluo, and it actually means to cancel a debt, to to dissolve a contract, or even to grant a divorce. It's a legal term. And so Jesus legally dealt with what was holding her in sickness for those 18 years. It, they had her bent over. And then it says, then he touched her, and she was made straight. Well, I tell people, I said, Jesus didn't touch her until he dealt with the legal issue that was denying her right to be healed. Because even under the old covenant, she had a right to be healed. She was... She was an Israelite. She was Jewish. The, there was healing in that covenant. And so so he he said, he literally said, he said, he said, I undo every legal right the enemy is using to keep you out of your covenant rights. And so when he undid it, when he when he loosed, when he dissolved the contract, canceled the debt, gave gave the decree of divorcement, that legal thing, then he laid his hands on. So this is what I tell people. I said, if the enemy has a legal right that he's denying your healing with. He can actually deny the anointing the right to bring that healing. Because you and I have probably both seen this. I have prayed for people and watched them visibly be touched by the anointing. I mean, visibly. I'm talking about whether it's shaking or or whatever. Many times people aren't don't manifest like that, but sometimes they do. I have watched this happen, and yet they still be sick. Because I believe that if there's a legal issue that the enemy is using... You have to stop and deal with that from the court of heaven, move that out of the way so that the anointing is now free to have the effect that it was given for, which is to bring healing and deliverance and, and all those sorts of things. So so I've watched this happen. And so now whenever I deal with people, I say, okay, I'm going to assume, unless I know more, I'm going to assume that this person is sick and it's the thief and the robber that's doing this. And I'm just going to release faith, anointing, power, Pray on the basis of who Jesus is and what he has done. But if they still remain sick, I'm going to have to back up and say, okay, is there something legal here that's being used to hold this person in this condition, like that woman for 18 years? And then there's other, other uh, illustrations in Scripture where you see this same principle. For instance, when the man was let down through the roof, what did Jesus do? He said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Why did he do that? Well, we know he was manifesting his, his right to forgive sins, but he was also removing the legal right that had him paralyzed in the first place so that then he could speak the word and the man could get up and walk out in the midst of them all. And so you see this several times in different times in Scripture where there's something legal that's at work that has to be dealt with before the, before the healing that Jesus died for us to have can occur. And, and, and let me just say this. I, I know we're on the same page on this, or we I probably wouldn't be on the show, but but... I've run into so many people that said that want to pat me on the head, so to speak, and say, you poor, simple man, don't you understand that when Jesus died on the cross, he did it all? And I said, oh, I do understand that. I said, I believe that with every part of my being. But I also believe that Peter said that the devil is still our legal opponent in 1 Peter 5, 8, and you have to be on guard or he will build a case against you 
that in the midst of everything that Jesus did for us, he will still find the legal right to devour us. And so I said, if the Apostle Peter believed that, then I said, I believe I'm on pretty sound footing, pretty, pretty sound ground to realize that, that, that our contention is, is in a legal realm and that I have to be aware he can build cases against us in the spirit world as the accuser, as the antidecos that gives him the right to hold us and even our generations in sickness and disease so often. So that's just the basis of, of that idea and, and, and uh, the concept of how we function in healing from a court of heaven perspective. You know, Robert, if you're describing all this, this lack of education in preaching and teaching, and we're not talking about spiritual warfare now. That's right. Okay. This is clearly a separate category, and we're looking at the court of heaven, and we're saying that we do have an adversary. We know that. We know in the name Hasatan, he's, accu he's the accuser of the brethren. Uh, he's not the accuser of the non-believers. He's not an enemy of God. He is uh, uh, an adversary to the believer trying to disclaim, defame, and derail your walk with the Lord. Uh, there's some who are believers that never see disease or illness whatsoever. Uh, my question is sometimes if you've never been under attack, then you just haven't gotten close enough to the front line. Uh, you know, so, you know, when the time comes, you know, where will you be? I can't answer that question. But I know that I'm black and blue and punched in the eye and I'm doing battle all the time because generals don't get shot, privates do, and um, um, I'm, I'm out there fighting uh, mm. that fight. Uh, but I also know that people are lulled in this false sense of security of um, their definition of salvation their understanding of uh, or, or lack of understanding and emphasis on Jesus' statement that says, if you follow me, there will be tribulation. Meaning you've now been called, it's like getting a jury duty notice. You're now on a list, okay? You, you are now recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, but that Lamb's Book of Life resides in the courts of heaven and anyone who has legal access to that document can go through that document and read through anybody's name that's in there and say well, what about this and even God himself uh, has this conversation with Job uh, mm -hmm. with, with Satan about Job he's there and he says hey what have you been doing I've been wandering to and fro and, and he virtually says well come on over and check the book okay Flip to the J's. Okay. Uh, have you considered, scroll down, uh, look at line 29. Uh, have you considered my son Job? Oh, no, as a matter of fact. Okay, what do you want to have happen? Well, listen, you can do anything you want. You just can't kill him. All right, I'm set free. Okay, I've been in court. I've talked to the judge advocate, I've talked to this chief justice, and I've now looked in the book, and even God himself. And so what do we have happen? We have this masquerade as an angel of light who leaves earth, because he says, where have you been? He says, Walk, walking to and fro. It's the same statement of God walking in the garden. It's the same Hebrew word walking to and fro. God just doesn't st stand there. He's walking. Where is he going to and fro? He's searching. Adam, where are you? Okay. Yeah. Now, Job, what have you been doing, Job? Well, I've been searching to and fro. Well, let me, let me point you in the right direction. Now, we have this, this court case. In the book of Job is this court case. Right. We have eyewitnesses testifying and giving their account of how they see the circumstance. We see during the course and length of a court case, 
uh, a home being foreclosed on, uh, children dying, life happening all along while this court case is being negotiated mm -hmm. and ultimately the verdict is not guilty and he is given twice yes. as compensation for this trial and tribulation he's been through. Mm -hmm. Did Job sin? Did Job rail against God? No, he ran the gauntlet and he came out on the other end and he was found not guilty. Okay? Mm -hmm. We've been rendered not guilty by virtue of the price that's been paid. But that doesn't mean we're not going to face more trials and new accusations and the dredging up of our past by an adversary that wants to remind us of our filthy rags. Mm -hmm. And God gives him access. So this light that goes from earth through the atmospheric heaven, through outer space, into the court of heaven, uh, must look like a UFO because he's traveling to and fro as a masquerade as an angel of light. Well, mm -hmm. you got other angels involved in the picture as well. You know, there's all the DAs, there's all the prosecutors, there's all this. And so when you frame it this way, we understand that if there is something impeding us, then the verdict can be probation mm -hmm. until you do your 1,200 hours of community service, until you get rid of that sin that you're currently in. Your healing is on the other side of 1,200 hours of community service. Okay, I grant you healing, but you're going to have to get rid of that sin, which is impeding that healing. And you make the perfect case for this. Uh, Robert, I could talk to you for days. We're so on the same page in this. I want to encourage our audience receiving healing from the courts of heaven. Robert Henderson, this is an incredible work. This is not on the sensational. This is on the understanding of God's economy and the court of heaven. And if you can grab a hold of it, you can grab a hold of your healing. Robert Henderson, Thank you so much for this hour you've spent with us. It flew by as if it were just five minutes ago we started this conversation. I welcome you back on the show anytime that you want to talk about this incredible concept of the courts of heaven and receiving you your much. healing. Thank you. Yeah, so very much. It's been my honor. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And that brings to an end our live broadcast day. But that doesn't mean we go off the air. We broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week here on IgnitingNation.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and on WND TV. So hopefully you'll follow us on our IgnitingNation.com page and all of social media so that you don't miss one of these incredible episodes of Revealing the Truth. Until we see you right back here in our studio on Monday morning, we bid you Shabbat Shalom and Shavuot Tov. Have a great week. We'll see you then.